that's enough. I mean, that's enough to make somebody look like that. Another might be the particular form or mode of instruction is one that is, for this particular child, not terribly effective for a host of reasons. Um, or it's one that this particular child doesn't have a whole lot of experience with. Um, the norms of the classroom come into play yeah. as well. It, you, you may be seeing this one person behaving this way, but not seeing all their neighbors doing slight variations or you know, decreased intensity variations on exactly yeah. what they're doing. And you, you zero in on this person because they're the one that's moving the, the most. The noticeable, the most yeah. noticeable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, but there's a, there's a trap to to go with what's obvious, with what's right on the surface, right? Mm -hmm. Because sitting right next to that kid who's constantly fidgeting, but might be passing the tests, might be a kid who looks perfectly compliant, right? L appears to be paying attention because, uh, by the second grade, had learned um, doctoral student behavior of, you know, looking like you're paying attention, look like you're attending to the class, and living a, a living your own life in your mind quite independently from that. I mean then. Which, which is the worst problem? I'd rather have the fidgeter who's engaged yeah. than the, the one who looks compliant and participating, but is, her fa is in fact in her mind taking various vacations that are a long way from the classroom. Yeah. So we've got to be careful. But, that's, that's but that, that, that statement right there says an awful lot about kind of your proclivities as a teacher, your interest, your approach to things like management, your approach to um, things like, you know, th the way you value what it is that's going on in your classroom, um, the way you see the role of students, things like that. And that, that's, that's part of this, I think, for me at least, this interpretive process is kind of coming face to face with playing the believing game of, wow, if this interpretation is correct, what does that say? for me in terms of you know, how, how, do, how do I need to think to go on from here based on this interpretation if it is correct. And, and sometimes you come up against some pretty scary, painful, difficult realizations, maybe about you as a teacher, maybe about you and the way you view your students, that, that's tough to swallow. In part because it's uh, using the interpretations to allocate blame. Yeah as distinct from figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're pushed to do that because we want to we want to teach, right? Mm -hmm. we, we feel very vulnerable, very busy, we're visible, we're learning how to do this, and so we tend to relate everything to us. Yeah. And so the kid so the kid fidgets, but we are inclined to, to interpret that as disrespect, for example, toward mm -hmm. us because mm -hmm. they're not paying attention. Yeah. It, and and that might that might be like taking it personally when it rains. I, as I recall, there was a kid like this in one of those working teachers uh, cases, mm -hmm. and and she she came in with something like an indictment against him. It was actually severe worry, but it was one of those. It was making he was he was finding ways to make her feel like she wasn't a teacher. By the time she finished thinking carefully about what she'd actually been seeing and worked through various interpretations, she wound up thinking that his getting up and walking around was how he his attempt to avoid make doing things that were worse than that. It was very hard for him to sit. Okay? That he, he was a, you know, normal. It was an alternative compliance. Right. Normal is a wide range, right? And so what he was, he was working off some kind of a tension, right? That was building up in him by getting up and moving around. Uh, where she ended up with the interpretation that she ended up with was that that he was relieving this tension, whatever it was, by moving around. She just moved him over to the back corner of the class where he could get up and do that without disturbing anybody. Yeah. And she made some deals with him about <laughs> staying in touch, and so he, he wound up having permission to do that. So the main thing that happened was she changed her interpretation from this kid is opposing me, right? This kid won't attend to me, to he's doing that instead of something that would be more disturbing to me, you know, and he knows that. And, and she got onto a more workable basis, in part by taking herself out of the center of the universe and looking at it from his point of view. Mm -hmm. This is one of the big deals that people, you know, one of the things you can gain, I think, in the interpretive stage is learning to see things from other people's point of view. We admire people, kids admire teachers, who can see things from different perspectives. 
And by working at interpretation, we can work at learning how to do that. I mean, part of it's just practical, getting new angles for us to act on. But we can also make ourselves better teachers, better people, by learning to see things from other people's points of view. So one of the, I, I want to come back to one other thing, and this may be two segments here. But <clears throat> one of the, so one of the things that you mentioned um, has some difficult consequences for some people to face, particularly if you have a very rigid defined notion of what it means to work with kids, to teach, to be in charge, to be in charge. Mm -hmm. If you have a rigid notion of what it means to to possess power and authority in a classroom, gain um, and keep control. I mean, these are all things and and you know, there are people for whom a rigid sense of these things might work. But the vast majority of teachers who find success with the most kids are those who have flexible, um, interactive patterns. You see what I'm getting at in, in terms of, so when you're talking, I can, I can see somebody responding saying, well, it sounds like you're condoning bad behavior in the classroom. And your response is, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm, no. I'm, I'm playing a, a game of what's, what, you know, what can I live with, what can this student live with, how can we make a community work in this classroom, yes. which is very different than if you're not sitting in your seat quiet with your hands on the desk, then you're bad, you're doing something wrong as a student. And th having that mindset about student behavior walking into a classroom it's going to be pretty depressing. I'm, I, I, check me out. I, I'm, I'm inclined to think there's a pretty well-established generalization that experienced teachers just ignore a bunch of stuff that novice teachers try to control. Mm. Ah. Right? Mm -hmm. I, I think I've read that repeatedly in, in the classroom management literature. Yeah. It makes sense to me because if you, so if you have this sort of image of an ideal classroom where everyone's you know, like this, and they're looking at me and all of that, and you're constantly trying to make it look like that. You spend your whole time, right? You spend all your time trying to make it look like that, and that makes it very hard to teach. I would guess one of the reasons that experienced teachers ignore a fair bit of mess is because they've gotten used to the idea that it's normal, there's a fair bit of mess, and they don't want to spend all their time and energy trying to remove the untidiness. They'd rather get on with the main part of teaching. Well, and that a lot of these kids in the classroom are not the same kind of students that I was. <laughs> and their expression within the classroom is not what I, what I experienced or understood mm -hmm. as good studenting, you know, from, from my days. 